Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning praying that um, if there's anybody here today, Lord, that isn't sure of their salvation, that questions whether they're really saved, that wonders, um, can anyone really be sure? Lord, let this message speak to them. Help them to see that indeed you can be sure of the certainty of being in heaven with you someday, Lord Jesus, as we talk about this powerful subject of what it means to be saved. In the precious name of you, Lord Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. My thoughts go back to when I was in Sunday school, and I was a preacher's kid, and I knew all the answers, and the teachers loved having me in Sunday school because they'd ask questions, and most of the kids wouldn't answer at all, but I always answered, and so I loved Sunday school. I loved teachers like Denny Kelso and Skip Kruger and Mrs. Mrs. Kruger and um, on and on and on, all these wonderful teachers that I had, but I've got to tell you, I'm not sure I was saved then. You're probably thinking, how could that be? You were brought up in the church. You were baptized. Are you saying, Pastor Dave, that baptism doesn't work? I'm not saying that at all. But when you get to be, oh, eight, nine, ten years old, you should start to see the effects of that baptism and what you really believe should start to be verbalized. So I was confirmed and made a public acknowledgement of my faith and stood before the congregation and said, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. But if somebody would have asked me then, if you would stand before God, if you were to die and stand before God, and he would ask you, why should I allow you into my heaven? What would you say? I would have said when I was an eighth or ninth grader, believe it or not, I'm a good person. I've done my best. I've been brought up in the church. I go to church regularly. And that's why I'm saved. How would you answer that question? If you were to stand before the gates of heaven today, if you passed on, and God would ask you, why should I allow you into my heaven what would you say? And you'd say, well, Pastor Dave, the answer for that is easy. Christ died and rose again for me. Even that answer is incomplete. Does that shock you? (laughs) What? Really? That answer is incomplete? You see, a person can go to church every Sunday Be confirmed in the faith, study the scriptures, even be a leader in the church and still not be saved. A person can know all those Bible stories, can know about the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the story of the ascension of Christ, and still not be saved. A person can be baptized into the faith, confirmed in the faith, make a public acknowledgement of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through confirmation and say all the wonderful things and know all the right answers and even have the catechism memorized and still not be saved. A person can go to church every Sunday Listen to the sermons, sing the hymns, pray the prayers. Acknowledge maybe that God somehow is in this place. And still not be saved. So what we're going to be talking about today is what does it mean to be saved And that's really a good question, and there's a powerful answer that's simple and straightforward, but I've set this sermon up today because I really want to make you think. I'm not here to cast away doubt about your salvation or to make you wonder or question whether you're saved, but hopefully you'll be comforted by what I say today so that you know beyond reservation, without a doubt, that when you die, you'll spend eternity with Christ. How many of you want to have that today? Raise your hand. Yeah. So the big question we have today is, what does it mean to be saved? And 
We look at this scripture. I love it. Would you read it with me? Romans 10, verse 9. Let's read it together. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The first thing this tells us is if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. I love that. What that means is this affirmation of faith that you have in Jesus Christ resides in your heart. That you acknowledge with your mouth that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And that's what you believe in your heart. Listen to this. There is an integral connection between what you confess with your lips and what you believe in your heart. If you're a Denver Nuggets fan in your heart, you say it with your lips. If you're a Bronco fan in your heart, you say it with your lips. If you love your family in your heart, you say it with your lips. If you believe in Jesus Christ in your heart, you what? Say it with your lips. Yeah. That's what we're saying. There is that integral connection. And so we say that you believe in Jesus. And so what does it mean to believe in Jesus? It means to have heartfelt faith and confidence relying on the promises of God that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for you. And that confession, that belief that you have in your heart is confessed with your lips. Look at what this text says. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? That Jesus is Lord. The, the word Lord in the Greek is the word kyrios. And it comes from the derivative in the Old Testament, meaning, listen to this, Yahweh or Jehovah. You are saying, when you say you believe in Jesus, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Jehovah, that Jesus is Yahweh, that Jesus is on the same par with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's what you're acknowledging. That was the early church confession. Jesus is Lord. People would walk away and walk around and say this, Jesus is Lord. Long before there was the Apostles' Creed or any statement of faith or any confession of faith, the early church confession that Christians said to one another is, Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Lord. And this is the confession they made with their lips because they believed it in their what? Heart. So, this is what it means to be saved. To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And to believe in your heart, I love this, that God, what's it say there? What? Raised him from the dead. Isn't it interesting that the crucifixion isn't mentioned there? And there's a reason for that. Obviously, we know that God laid our sin on his son, that Jesus made full payment for our sin on the cross, that he died for sin, that he died for sinners. You've heard that week in and week out. We get that. But had Christ not been raised from the dead, if Jesus had not defeated death through his resurrection, if people had not had a face-to-face -face encounter with the risen Lord, the Bible says we would not be saved. You see, the linchpin... The very foundation and essence of the faith in the New Testament was not just the crucifixion of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ. And people, after they saw Jesus face to face, walked around and said this, Jesus lives. I've seen him. I've touched him. I beheld his face. Jesus Christ is Christus Victor, the Christ who is victorious over sin and hell and death and the grave. And so this says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Do you get that? Can I get an amen? Amen. No works. We can't contribute to our salvation. We can't earn it through what we do or leave undone. Salvation is given to us wrapped up in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and he offers it to you as a free gift, and you take it by saying, I believe in Christ. I believe it in my heart, and I confess it with my mouth. This is what the scriptures say. I love it. Christ was crucified for our sins and raised again for our justification. Do you know what that means? That's Romans chapter 4. That means that God accepted the sacrifice of his son and his yes and amen to the finished work of Jesus on the cross is to raise his son from the dead. 
This is how 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says it, where St. Paul writes these words. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. So a fundamental principle of the early church confession was Jesus Christ lives, he is Lord, he is risen from the grave. Now what does God do? He takes the finished work of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. By the way, I know you guys know this. Like some of you might be, the the eyelids are starting to close, you know, (laughs) because you've heard this so often. But I want to tell you, there's no more fundamental sermon, no more important sermon that we preach during the year than one like this. Because if you believe what I'm talking about today, If you say, I believe it in my heart and I confess it with my lips, the difference between that is heaven versus hell. Salvation versus total separation from God. Being found, being lost. That's the difference. And so it's fundamentally important that we leave this place thinking and knowing and believing that we cannot earn our salvation, that it's wrapped up in Christ, offered to us as a free gift, we accept it by faith, and we are good to go. Isn't that comforting? Can I get any, man? It's really comforting, man. Here's why. I tell you what. <clears throat> How many of you, I mean, I'm 62 now. Um, I... I I'm not the same guy I was at 42, right? Physically, I'm talking about. Some people say you still preach the same. Maybe, maybe not, but I don't feel the same. Um, A couple days ago, as many of you know, we we have this wonderful thing called the Youth Dessert Theater here, DU Dessert Theater. And so my wife had to go get some pies and store them in the refrigerator. And uh, and, and instead of um, going to the back of the van, I backed up the van near the refrigerator in our garage so that we could easily transport the pies. Now, I've got one of those things hanging from the ceiling about 12 feet high that tells you where to stop your car, you know what I'm talking about, so that it's just in the right position. So we shut the gate and it ripped that thing off. And I am so anal about stupid stuff like that. I had to fix it and I had to fix it yesterday, okay? So I walked out in the garage and I get out this little step stool. Now remember, this is 12 feet up in the air. Okay? So I get out this step stool. And, and don't tell my wife, but I fell off of it. And the only individual in our household that knew it was my dog. Because he came running to the door right away and he was yelling and screaming. My wife was doing something else. was totally oblivious and I was too embarrassed to tell her. So then I tried to step up on the window of the van to get up 12 feet high. I had my slippers on. I fell off again. I thought, this is ridiculous. So my son finally got up and I said, dude, would you, would you reattach that thing to the little deal up there so that we can take Oh, yeah, Dad. And I expected him, like me, to get out the little step stool, you know, and to carefully go up and stuff. What did he do? He ran. He ran right up the van, up to the roof, attached it. It took him like five seconds. I could have never done that. He, listen to this. He did the work. I received the benefit. You get what I'm saying? Jesus did all the work, all the work, all the work, guys, for our salvation. And we receive the benefit. Christianity is simple. The greatest gift in the world is free. Here's what we're saying. What does it mean to be saved? To confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's it. So how do you live then as a result of that? Because you know you're saved, this is how you can live. First of all, comforted. Comforted that even when you mess up in the worst way, that sin, that mess up is covered by the blood of Christ. Did you hear the text? There's no shame. Yeah, we carry shame over our sin and over the guilt of our sin, but God covers it through his son, Jesus. And so we are comforted by that, and we walk out of this place totally comforted by the fact that our sins are forgiven. 
And you receive it three times. You receive it in a public worship through the proclamation of absolution, which Pastor Tim did today, through the proclamation of the gospel, through the sermon which you're hearing today, through the receiving of the bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, which you're receiving today, you are assured today and comforted today that when you walk out the double doors of this place, your sins are forgiven, and no matter how bad you fail, you go to God with that sin, and he says, it was paid for fully through the finished work of my son. So you walk out of this place comforted. Secondly, you walk out of this place confident. There's no wondering, no questioning, no uncertainty about where you're going to go when you leave this earth. You don't answer the question, are you saved? Well, I hope so. I, I think so. I might be. I possibly could be. I, I hope I've been good enough. I remember, by the way, remember what I said when I started the sermon here that I told my dad, my dad, my dad, the preacher dad, that I was going to heaven because of my works, he didn't know whether to spit or wind his watch, man. I'm telling you. Like, what in the world? What have you been doing? Have you not been listening? This is, I, I'm preaching this as boldly as I can. I don't want anybody today to leave this place uncertain with some doubt and hesitation where you're heading. The moment you die, your soul departs from your body, and you go to be with Jesus. You can be certain of it. Why? Because salvation is dependent on you? No, salvation is dependent on him. And he did it all. Amen? So you can be comforted that your sins are forgiven. You can be confident where you're going to go. And then you can be anxious. Anxious? Anxious. I remember when the first, I, I've been to Disneyland many times. I love Disneyland. I know, you know, there's some stuff about Disneyland, some political ramifications. I get that. But man, if you've been there, it's awesome. And I remember the first time I went, I was in sixth grade, and my folks kind of popped it on me that we were going to go to the Rose Parade because the Lutheran Hour float was in that parade. And my folks that particular year helped to put roses on the float. So here we are in Southern California, and my dad tells me the day before we go, we're going to Disneyland tomorrow. I was really anxious in a good way. I couldn't wait. And when I talk about being anxious, I'm talking about we are so anxious to share our faith. We are so, so anxious to tell people that they're saved by faith in Christ, that they don't have to work for it. Now, we're anxious for the one person that we've identified on that board that doesn't know Jesus. We're anxious for the Holy Spirit to open the door for us to share our faith. We're anxious for them to make a confession of faith. We leave this place anxious to testify the grace of God. We're anxious. So because we're saved, we can live comforted, confident, and anxious to share our faith. Comforted that our sins are forgiven, confident of where we're going to go, and anxious to tell others about it. This is what it means to be saved. So I ask that question one more time. If you were to die today and stand before the gates of heaven... And God would ask you, why should I allow you into my heaven? And I said, if you say, well, Christ lived and died for me, and I said that answer is incomplete. Remember when I said that? How many of you remember that? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. And you said, well, Christ died and rose again for me. You'd think that sounds right. And I said, that answer is incomplete. If you say... I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ died and rose again for me. That's the answer. What does it mean to be saved? To confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. That's it. 
You can leave this place today comfortable, confident, and anxious to share that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for um, your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Help us to take the word that we've been challenged with today and also comforted with today, Lord, and share it with others. If there's anybody here today that wasn't sure how they get to heaven, wasn't sure of their salvation, oh, Lord, I pray that now they are as a result of not what I've said but what your word says because your word is powerful. And we thank you, God, for your word. In the precious name of you, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. Please stand.